Um, I'm going to take a little break today from that. Um, I'm going to look at Psalm 100. It's a short psalm, five verses. So if you have a Bible, you can follow along. If not, you can just listen. I think this is about dead, but that's all right. Um, I was reading a devotional on my phone early in the week, and it's kind of jumped out at me. So I wanted to um, preach on, on Psalm 100 this morning. So we'll go ahead and read that, that passage. Psalm 100, verses 1 through 5. A psalm for giving thanks. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. When it comes to having joy as a Christian, happiness, you may have a tendency to think that it's kind of a good thing to have joy, not necessarily something you have to have, as if it's kind of something optional. Some people tend to be more happy and joyful than other people, and other people, it's just not my, my thing. Uh, but if you take a look at Scripture, and in particular this text, Psalm 100, you'll find that joy is really an essential part of being a child of God. It's one of the, one of the fruits of the Spirit, right? Joy. Jesus said in John 15, 11, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. 1 John 1, 4 says, We are writing these things to you so that your joy may be complete. That's why the whole book of 1 John was written, so that you could have fullness of joy through Jesus Christ. And as Christians, we, we might tend to believe that happiness doesn't really matter. We might tend to erroneously think that the pursuit of happiness is a worldly thing, and it's a selfish thing. That's what unbelievers search for, happiness. Christians don't need to be concerned with being happy. What you need to do is pick up your cross and suffer for Jesus, and being happy in the process is irrelevant. As if suffering and joy are mutually exclusive things, but they're not. What's important to realize and see from this passage of Scripture is that when it comes to joy, it's not something that's simply encouraged, it's actually commanded to be joyful. Now, it might seem strange, because if you came to me and you're sad about something, and then you're looking for consolation or encouragement, and I just said, you need to be happy. Just, just be happy. Or even if I said, God commands you to be happy, therefore, be happy. That's not very helpful, is it? Right? You, you, what you need is a reason to be happy, a reason to be joyful. Remember that song? I guess it was in the, I don't know, early 80s or late 70s, Don't Worry, Be Happy. I didn't know who sang it, but I looked it up. It was Bobby McFerrin. Right? That song's full of commands to be happy. But he doesn't really give you a reason why. Aside from the fact that you should just be happy. I'll read some of the lyrics. Here's a little song I wrote. You might want to sing it note for note. Don't worry. Be happy. In every life we have some trouble, but when you worry, you make it double. Don't worry. Be happy. And got no place to lay your head. Somebody came and took your bed. Don't worry. Be happy. The landlord say your rent is late. He may have to litigate. Don't worry. Be happy. Here, I give you my phone number. When you worry, call me. I make you happy. Don't worry. Be happy. Don't worry. Be happy. Ain't got no cash. Ain't got no style. Ain't got no gal to make you smile. Don't worry. Be happy. Because when you worry, your face will frown and that will bring everybody down. So don't worry. Be happy. Does that help? I don't have his number. He didn't release it. 
So his reasoning for being happy, the only real reason he gave there is because your frown is going to make everyone else frown. You're going to bring everybody else down if you're frown. So be happy. Now, I know it's just a silly song. You take it with a grain of salt. But I think it kind of speaks volumes to uh, what the world says about happiness and joy. That there really is no good reason to be happy. But you should just be happy. Be happy, right? It's a command from the world without a reason behind it. And so if you're a, any sort of thinking person and you're down about something, someone telling you to be happy without giving you a reason doesn't help. God commands us to be happy, yes, in his word, but there's a reason for it. There's many good reasons for it. So yes, God wants you to be happy. And this is not to say there's never going to be any sorrow in life. Jesus was a man of sorrows. But there should still be joy somewhere there in the, in the midst of sorrow. So God commands you to be happy, right? So let's look at those commands in the psalm. And then the reason reasons why we should be happy. So here there's basically, I counted six commands to either be joyful or to express that joy. It, it begins by saying, make a joyful noise to the Lord. And then serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Those are all commands for joy or to express joy and then to go along with those commands are a couple motivating factors to be joyful and to express joy. And that is that we are to know the Lord is God and that the Lord is good. So let's look at those commands and then the, the reasons behind this joy that we must have. First, you'll notice in your, in your Bible, uh, before verse 1, or maybe it's included in verse 1, I'm not sure, but the way mine has it, it's kind of like a, a subheading there. Uh, it says that this is a psalm for giving thanks. A psalm for giving thanks. And I think this tells us <clears throat> that true, lasting joy in the Lord is rooted in thanksgiving, in a thankful spirit. A thankful spirit naturally produces joy. So if you're ungrateful, you're unthankful, it's impossible to be happy, right? If you're full of complaints and murmuring and gratitude, maybe someone would say something to you, you know, if you have a particularly bad day, you're in a bad mood, and someone might say, well, nothing, nothing's making you happy, right? You're just not happy. If you're unthankful, you can't be joyful. So if you're not joyful, you're not being thankful. So as as far as diagnosing the lack of joy in your life, the root cause of it is really a lack of thanksgiving. This is a psalm for giving thanks. If you could read this and say, I can't sing to God, I can't praise Him, I can't enter into His gates with thanksgiving, I can't serve Him with gladness, then you're not thankful to God. And there could be a, re a few reasons why you're not thankful to God. One of them, the, the, the very foundational level, could be that maybe you're not converted, you don't know God, you might not have been born again, you haven't turned from your sin, you haven't trusted in, in Christ alone, you haven't passed from death to life. And that's the case. Naturally, you're not going to really understand the gratitude and the thanksgiving that is associated with salvation. Or you might be thankful to God for His common grace and His mercy, maybe He's giving you, know, giving you life and breath and food and shelter, all those things, but you're not going to have that deep rooted thanksgiving that is overflowing with joy because you know that Jesus has saved your soul and that you've been made right with God uh, through Jesus' death on your behalf. So being unconverted may be the cause of your lack of joy, but even for the born-again, regenerated believer in Christ, it's certainly possible and sadly all too common to not be joyful. And that comes about when we too become ungrateful and murmur and complain. And joy and thanksgiving are directly correlated to one another. And when we as believers begin to forget the great work of God's grace in saving us, 
through his death on our behalf and his victory over the grave, we begin to complain, right? We become ungrateful and we live as if God has done nothing for us and in turn we lose our joy. Verse 1 says, make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. And verse 2, come into his presence with singing. So one of the evidences of having joy in the Lord is that you want to sing praises to him. This is full of, the, the Psalms are all songs to God and, and there's commands to sing. And throughout it, in Psalm 66, 1, for example, shout for joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Verse 4 of our text here says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Do you sing praises to God? When we gather together for corporate worship, are you coming to God's presence with singing? Ephesians 4, the Apostle Paul writes in verse 19, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks, there's that connection again, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I understand there are times when you can't sing. I'm not trying to make this like a rule book here. Maybe it's a song you don't know as we gather together, it's a new song. Maybe, you have, uh, maybe you're in a place where the song the church is singing, you, you have theological disagreements with. I've had that happen, I've gone to churches, I'm like, I cannot sing this song, this is terrible. And so I don't sing it. Maybe the music's too loud, you can't sing, it's almost like pointless, all you hear is the bass or the, the drums or the electric guitar, you know, during the solo, you're not going to sing, right? Um, that's common in many churches today to make it like a, a rock band. Um, sometimes you just can't sing, I've been in those situations. But putting all of that stuff aside, those exceptions, when you gather together with God's people, or even if you're alone, do you sing praises to God. True singing from the heart to God is rooted in a thankful, joyful heart. It is, it's the overflow of joy. You could say in some ways it's the culmination of our joy. So if you're a person who doesn't sing to God, simple reason, it's, with those exceptions aside, if you're not a person that sings to God, sings praises to Him, you're lacking joy. Plain and simple. It doesn't matter if you can't sing on key, or you, you don't have to sing loudly, but if singing praises to God does not come naturally to you, then you're not filled with the joy of the Lord. That's not my opinion, that's the word of God. Singing, even those who aren't musically inclined, is really a natural thing for all human beings, right? We sing when we're happy. Maybe, maybe while you're alone. Maybe you don't always burst out in a song. I don't do that. But it's kind of a natural emotion. You may hear a song that you like and you naturally want to sing along. It's a sense of joy. So if you could go to, let's say, a secular concert and belt out every word to some frivolous song with joy and then come to church and all of a sudden, you know, you can't open your mouth to sing to your creator, your redeemer. Your joy is found in temporary, vain things of the world and not... In Christ, if you, and if you could scream at the top of your lungs at a football game or a baseball game, but all of a sudden when it comes to singing praises to God, you're at a loss for words, even though the words are right in front of you on the screen or in the book. If that's the case, you're lacking in true, meaningful gospel joy, because one of the evidences that you have joy in God is that you sing to Him. And yes, singing to God is a command, but it's a command that must be obeyed out of a genuine desire to do so. Just like all of God's commands, really. So don't sing to God uh, as if he's got a gun to your head and he's gonna, you know, if you don't sing, he's gonna pull the trigger. Don't sing to God because the preacher said you have to sing to God, so now I'm gonna force myself to do so. Sing to God because you love him. Sing to God because you're thankful for his grace and salvation. And sing to him because you're genuinely happy and joyful about what he has done and who he is. 
If you cannot sing to him, then seek after him and wrestle with God until he gives you that joy that results in singing. And just a word of advice, kind of a side note here. If, if you're in a place where you don't feel like singing to God, because we all have those moments, right? I would encourage you to do it anyway. Get alone and sing songs to him. In a sense, force yourself to do it. Uh, it's tremendously helpful to your soul. So while singing can be a evidence of joy, it's also a means of acquiring joy. So yes, forcing yourself at times to sing is a practical way to fight for joy. So joy is something that sometimes we have to fight to get. It's like Jacob wrestled with God until he blessed him. To be blessed is to be happy. That's what it means. So sometimes you have to fight to get it. Verse 2 says, serve the Lord with gladness. That word in the Hebrew there, serve, can also be translated as work or worship. Serve, work, worship. Uh, so serving the Lord, working for the Lord, worshiping the Lord are all kind of synonymous things. Whatever work the Lord has called you to do is your service and your worship to him. So worship is not something that only happens on Sunday mornings for the Christian. Worship is every day for the believer. And we worship the Lord when we work and when we do whatever it is he's called us and gifted us to do. It could be working with your hands. It could be working in an office. It could be raising your children, running a business. It could be going to your quote-unquote dead-end job. And if you look at what you do, even if you don't particularly enjoy it, if you looked at that as a form of worship, it only makes sense that you should be glad while doing it. Serve the Lord with gladness. Work for the Lord with gladness. God does not want you to serve him while being a miserable complainer. He wants you to serve him while being joyful and happy. He wants you to do everything as unto him. And so serve him, work for him, with gladness, with joy. So we've kind of looked at the, the commands to be joyful. Uh, but again, if all, all we get out of this, if all we get out of this passage is God commands you to be happy, that's not helpful. In fact, it can make things even worse if you're lacking joy. Jesus says commands are not burdensome, right? They're not heavy. God gives us commands for our benefits, and, and having joy is one of them. So let's look at some reasons why we must be joyful and how we can obtain this joy. How can we get this? Verse 3 says, Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. In Hebrew, it's Know that Yahweh is Elohim. Know that God is God. One of the ways in which we can obtain a greater joy is by knowing who God is. A deeper knowledge of God leads to greater joy. Because God is the source of all joy. And God is altogether happy. Right? He does what pleases Him. And, and while He's certainly grieved at times, at sin, right? And, and does pour out his anger and his wrath upon those who refuse to repent. God at his core is happy and wants you to be happy. And he sent Jesus so you could be happy. So Jesus said these things, I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. What you need to understand is that true happiness, true joy, is found no other place and in no other person aside from Jesus Christ. He is the source of joy, and we partake in, in that joy when we surrender our lives to him in faith. Th that is why the key to having joy is knowing God. Because if you're looking for joy in any other thing or any other person other than God, you're looking for an inferior type of joy, a temporary joy. To 
paraphrase C.S. Lewis, you're playing with mud pies in the slum when you could be having a holiday by the sea. When you don't seek to have joy in God, you're going to seek it elsewhere, and it will be far inferior. You'll seek joy in the temporary musings of life and even sinful things of the world, things that are, will never satisfy your soul. To find joy, you must find God, because he is at his very essence happy. He is joyful. Thomas Aquinas said this, God is happiness by his essence, for he is happy not by acquisition or participation of something else, but by his essence. On the other hand, men are happy by participation. So God is the source of happiness. We obtain that happiness through him by participation, through Jesus, who said, my, my joy would be, may be in you. Augustine, the early church father, said, following after God is the desire of happiness. To reach God is happiness itself. Following after God is the desire of happiness. To reach God is happiness itself. So if you have a lack of joy, you realize you need more joy, which we all do. Grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Pursue him alone and not any of the inferior things of the world and you will find true happiness and that will remain forever even through times of sadness everyone is looking for happiness and that's not wrong but it's wrong to find it in anyone or anything other than jesus it says it is he who made us and we are his we are his people and the sheep of his pasture so if God is joy at his core, he is happiness by his very essence. And we are his people. We are his sheep being fed by him in his pastures. Then this once again shows us that true joy comes from him. And it also gives us a reason to be joyful, right? If you're a child of God, bought with the blood of Christ, you have the greatest reason to be joyful, Right, you, we sang the song, Jesus, thank you. Right, that It's all rooted in thanksgiving. Uh, you were at one time you know, a wandering goat, but by God's grace, he made you a sheep who now follows the shepherd if you are a Christian. So what more do you need to know in order to be joyful? If you're one of Christ's sheep, what more could you want? What greater joy is there than to be one of Christ's chosen sheep with the promise of eternal life? Now, further fuel for our joy is found in verse 5. Where it's, it begins by saying, for, right? That, you could also translate it as being because, right? For, because, it's the same meaning. For, because the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. So first, we are joyful in knowing that the Lord is good. In fact, God is the greatest good. He's, he's not based on some arbitrary standard of goodness. He is the source of all that is good, and he's the standard by which we measure goodness. So without God, there's no way to determine what is good and what is not good. One of the greatest evidences for uh, the existence of God is that without God, there is no standard for goodness. There is no standard for right and wrong. So if an atheist ever makes a moral statement declaring something to be immoral or that something is good, you just ask them by what standard. There is, they have no absolute standard. Their whole worldview is reduced to foolishness because they've forsaken the standard of all that is good and right, they've forsaken God. God's the greatest good, the source of all that is good, and it's a wonderful thing to be the child and the sheep of a good and loving God. Amen. However, if, you are, if you're not in Christ, that's actually your biggest problem, is that God is good. Because God is good, he hates sin, and has to punish sinners for their sin, but at the same time, God's loving and merciful 
and provided a way out from the wrath that all people deserve. And that way out is through his son, Jesus, who died in the place of sinners. He took the punishment. He took the payment for the sin we committed and thereby satisfied the good justice of God. And that payment for sin can be accredited to your account and your sins can be paid for by Christ if you turn from your sin and trust in Jesus alone today. The goodness of God is a terror for the unbeliever, but a great source of joy for the believer. Another source of joy for the Christian uh, is the fact that, God, uh, that God's love and faithfulness last forever. The psalmist says it endures forever to all generations. The reason why you'll never find lasting and fullness of joy in anything and anyone other than God is because nothing in this world lasts forever. Everyone would admit that. Everything you're banking on here in this life to satisfy the desires of your heart will eventually disappear in one way, shape, or form. Whether it's money, success, relationships, even things like pornography and drugs and alcohol and all things that people look for, for joy in, even entertainment, having the best house, the best vacation, financial security, anything this world has to offer, even if it's not inherently sinful, it's going to eventually not be there. It's going to disappear in one way or another. It's going to either disappear on its own, your money can just pick up wings and fly. You can have another government lockdown or whatever or you die and it's all gone either way it's gonna be done and so the level of joy you have is directly dependent upon the source of your joy is your pursuit of joy found in the temporary things of the world or is it found in God God's love and faithfulness endures forever for all generations it is something that never goes away for the believer. Is that the source of joy for you? Or are you looking to something else? Because if you're looking elsewhere for joy, you're not going to find a lasting source of it. But also, if you're looking elsewhere for joy, you're robbing God of the glory that's due Him. Because you see, joy is essential in the life of the Christian. Because it tells the world that God is the only one who can satisfy our souls. When you're happy in Jesus, we are telling a message to the world that all the things in this life don't compare to knowing Christ. He's the greatest good. He's the source of all goodness and joy. And when people see you happy in Christ, they should be, in a sense, jealous of you. And they should say, I don't have that, but I want what they have. So there's more at stake here than just your own personal happiness. This is not a matter of selfish pursuits. This is a matter of God being glorified. Like what John Piper says, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. Right? That gives God glory when we find our true joy and satisfaction in Him. So finding our delight in God alone brings Him glory. When we find our joy in lesser things, he's not glorified. When we are unhappy and ungrateful and have no joy because we're hoping in temporary things of the world, we don't look any different than anyone else. And I believe a few things bring reproach to the name of Christ more than a miserable Christian. A Christian who claims to know Jesus, claims to have eternal life, yet lives as if nothing uh, is going right for him and he's got nothing at all because maybe physical circumstances aren't so great. Please don't get me wrong. There's a time, perhaps many times, for sorrow. There are times for weeping. There are times of suffering, even for the sake of Christ. But that does not mean that we cannot have joy in the midst of all that, at least to some degree. And it doesn't mean that we stop fighting to obtain that joy. So even if you lose everything here and it brings pain and sorrow, if you have Christ, there must be some level of joy through the pain. As we look past the temporal and into the eternal, 
We look to the love and the faithfulness of God, which endures forever. And having true Christian joy doesn't, doesn't eliminate sorrow. But instead, it's a means of grace. God gives us to endure sorrow and hardship. Hebrews 12, 2. It says, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for what? The joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The joy Jesus had got him through the hardship of the cross. The greatest hardship any human being had ever gone through that you and I could never do. Jesus had joy even as he was being nailed to the cross and crucified. Did he shed tears? Certainly. Did he encounter excruciating pain? More than you ever will. He even drank the cup of God's wrath on your behalf, yet he had joy through it all, knowing that he was going to redeem a people for himself and would be glorified and seated at the right hand of the Father. Joy found in God is a sustaining grace through hard and sorrowful times. It doesn't mean we just slap on a smile and pretend everything's okay. But we do have a greater sense of, of joy by looking into the future of what God has promised for us. Now, just a few closing points with how... How do we fight for this joy? How do we obtain this joy? Where's the practical thing? Well, first, as I mentioned before, you have to make sure that you're born again. Make sure that you know you are trusting Christ alone. If you're not, you cry out to him to save you and trust in Jesus alone. Jesus said that the, the joy that he has, he wants to give that to you, and that only happens through faith in him. Secondly, for the believer, sing to God regularly might seem weird for us living in our culture but sing praises to god not only church on sunday mornings sing him by yourself sing to him in your car sing with your children your family sing even when you don't feel like it and you'll likely find the more you sing the more joy you will have Thirdly, study the attributes of God. Study the attributes of God. The more you learn about God, the deeper you dig into the scriptures to find out who God is, the greater your joy will be. If God is the source of all happiness, the more you know about him, the more happy you will be. And sadly, studying theology, uh, getting deep into who God is, studying the attributes of God, things like that, reading books about those topics. That's considered by many Christians, American Christians, uh, who don't have any attention span when it comes to that stuff, but can watch TV all day long. But when it comes to studying about the attributes of God, no, no, that's not practical, it's too abstract. That's just not true. Theology is just the study of God. Why would you not want to know more about God? We'd rather read you know, a little pamphlet with 10 tips to make your life better than to search the depths of the triune God. The deeper you grow in the knowledge of God, the deeper your sense of joy will be. And that's very practical and it's very applicable. It, it changes your whole mindset. And lastly, seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. Don't settle for the garbage this world has to offer you. Don't settle for mud pies in the slums when you can have a holiday by the sea. Pursue the unsearchable riches of Christ. If you're lacking in joy, don't search for it on the television or on your phone to distract you from your misery. Many of you probably need to shut off the TV, which is causing you fear and anxiety. And pursue your relationship with Jesus. Don't get distracted. Don't let all this insanity going on take your eyes off the prize. Spend as much time as you can in prayer and in the Word of God 
so that you'll be refreshed and reminded of the joy that is found in being a child of God. So as you see the world, it might seem, you know, everything's crumbling, falling away, falling apart. Remember the words of Jesus who said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And that should give us joy even in the most uncertain times. Amen. Let's pray. And then we'll have communion. Father, we thank you and we praise you that you are good. That your steadfast love endures forever and your faithfulness to all generations. That is something that we can hope in. That is something that gives us joy. So help us to trust in you and to look to you and to look to Christ to find our joy in Jesus alone who bore our wrath and shame and our sin and all our guilt and paid for it in full what more do we need Lord we pray that you would bring that to, to our minds right now as we partake of the Lord's Supper that this would not just be a solemn time but it would be a time of joy reminding us of what you've done we pray for all this in Jesus' name, amen.